You have every reason to believe that the New Orleans Saints will be better in 2023 than they were in 2022. And the fact is, they have everything they need and should be able to prove you right. We got all that and a little bit of land yet for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdat Nation and Houdat family? Welcome into another episode of Locked on Saints, your daily podcast covering your favorite team, the New Orleans Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks so much, as always, for making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget, you can subscribe and follow for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss a daily episode. And if you want to keep in touch and keep the conversation going one-on-one with me, you can fi- you can do that by heading over to joinsubtext.com slash locked on saints. As always, I'm your host, Ross Jackson at Ross Jackson Nola on Twitter, your New Orleans Saints expert credential member of the media. You can find me as the uh, senior writer and reporter over at Saints News Network over at Sports Illustrated's Fan Nation site covering the New Orleans Saints. You can also find me every Tuesday on Locked on NFL podcast and here with you every single Monday through Friday and then some on Locked on Saints. Today's episode of Locked on Saints brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel, official sports book of the NFL. You want to learn more about them, you can head over to FanDuel.com slash Locked on today. I want to tell you more about them later on today's episode. Here's what we got on the docket for you. We're going to take a look at all of the position battles or a bunch of the position battles that the Saints have upcoming once training camp gets off the ground next month. We're also going to take a look at the biggest question remaining ahead of training camp. Will the Saints make more roster moves? And if so, where will those happen? But the first thing I want to start off with here is the biggest lesson that we can take away from, uh, uh, you know, voluntary OTAs and mandatory minicamp, sort of that phase three, as they call it, of the offseason. And to me, the biggest lesson that we learned is that for, by all intents and purposes thus far, the New Orleans Saints should be better in 2023 than they were in 2022. And if they're not, then it is a big time failure of a season. And I have a hard time believing that they won't be a better team in 2023 than they were in 2022, barring a greater slew of injuries than we have seen in the previous past. Because I do think this team is deeper. I do think that they are more talented at the top of their roster. I do think that they are in a better environment for their scheme. I'll explain what that means in a little bit. So I do think that there are some important improvements that the New Orleans Saints have made over the course of the offseason. And if they can keep all of those things, all those improvements, as they expect them to be on the field, they should simply be better in 2023 than they were in 2022. And hopefully that doesn't mean eight, nine, as opposed to seven and 10 for you as a fan. But I do think that that is an example of them finishing better in 2023 than they would finish in 2022. But obviously you want better than that. I think this should be a 10 win team. I, I think this absolutely should be a 10 win team that wins its division next season. The schedule's weak, no matter how you look at it, the quarterbacks they're going up against, whack. The schedule, whack. The division, whack. It's all whack around them, right? I love that I just got to reference that. And if you got that reference, please let me know because that would make me very, very happy. Um, But everything around them is whack. Like, they should win. They should win the division. They should be a better team in 2023. I really, I really entertain myself with that one. Uh, but but the way that I look at it, let's, let's start it kind of like where they made their their most important improvement, right? It, it's It's been the conversation of the entire offseason. I feel like I've talked about Derek Carr more since the Senior Bowl when I dove on a couch giving you my crazy conspiracy theory about how Derek Carr was going to be the next New Orleans Saints quarterback, wink, wink, uh, to now I've talked about Derek Carr more over the course of this time than I have over the nine years of his entire career. And not for any reason of disliking him or anything like that. He just wasn't the quarterback that I covered, but he was a quarterback that I always appreciated. But I, I do think that they improved that quarterback position. They improved their quarterback play. The starter on their from their the intended starter, right, from their roster last year is still on the roster this year. And so really what you're looking at is two things. Is Derek Carr better than Andy Dalton just in terms of a player for player swap in the in the quarterback room? Easy, yes. Is Derek Carr better for this New Orleans Saints offense than Jameis Winston proved to be? I think we can we can assume yes thus far, based upon how he's run everything throughout training camp and all that other stuff. But the biggest determining factor might simply be, is one available when the other one couldn't be? Because that's kind of the thing that got in Jameis's way. He looked good as the New Orleans Saints quarterback, but then the injuries continued to pile up for him. Uh, so I think they've improved their quarterback play. 
a part of what they did in improving their quarterback play means that they also improved the environment around their scheme. So here's what I mean by that. The responsibilities of pre-snap checks, identifying pressure, that was something that both Jameis Winston and Andy Dalton struggled with. Trevor Simeon struggled with it. Taysom Hill struggled with it. Uh, Teddy didn't, which was cool. But you know, you had those guys that that came up and had to make all of the calls or the calls went to the center and there were some issues there. So I think now you get back to what is more familiar for this New Orleans Saints scheme, this New Orleans Saints system, this New Orleans Saints offense, which is the quarterback making all of those, those adjustments. And then sort of the accountability factor. Hey, we didn't connect on that. Bring me the ball back. We're running it again. Sending clips to the receivers saying, hey, what do you see here? What do you see here? Can you tell me what, what Drew would say? Can you tell me what you see? Can we break this down? Can I tell you what Devontae would see? All those other things. So I think that just kind of improves the environment around which the scheme is being installed. The next piece is that the defense is still strong. Um, your leaders are still there. Um, you know, if we want to go to each position group, defensive line, your leader there, Cam Jordan, no change. Linebacker, your leader there, Demario Davis, no change. Really, you look at those two, you look at the defense and you say, the leaders are still there. Cam Jordan, Demario Davis, no change. But then you can go further. Safeties, Tyron Matthew there, no change. Uh, corners, Marshawn Lattimore there, no change. So really the only place that you have like a big adjustment in terms of swapping out starters and all that is on the defensive interior. But you do have a little bit of cohesion because you've got guys like, look, Prince Amelie was on the practice squad. He comes over. It's, it's technically cohesion, but I wouldn't put that in the like leadership category. Malcolm Roach, maybe a little bit more so, has spent time with the team, got his next contract with the team, um, and then is back. But Colin Saunders is a Super Bowl winning defensive tackle multiple times over. Nathan Shepard is one of the most athletic and top pass rushing defensive tackles in the NFL back in 2022, just last season. That, that has value. Brian Brzee has been invested in with a first round pick. He can grow into being that leader, that captain, potentially a C on his chest someday all of that. So I do think that the, that the defense staying strong and pairing that defense with a quarterback that has succeeded and has more uh, game-winning drives since 2016 than any other quarterback in the NFL, considering that he has never had a defense better than top 20, which he only had once, and that was 20th, uh, there's a good pairing there. And I think that that's something that puts them in a situation to where they're ready to compete. Um, speaking of the defense, I think they got more athletic uh, and they got more um, they became a more attacking defensive line, which I think will help them in terms of generating pass rush where they kind of struggled early last season, but also up against the mobile quarterbacks. And then the last piece is coaches with synergy. Everybody now sees the game the same way. There's not a lot of Sean Payton holdover left on this coaching staff. It's now Dennis Allen and his guys that see the game the same way as him, which is exactly what Sean Payton had. Sean Payton had Sean Payton and his guys who see the game the way that he sees the game. Dennis Allen now has that after they kind of, you know, turned over the coaching staff this offseason. He's got guys that he's worked with before and Joe Woods and uh, Marcus Robertson. He's got guys that he's comfortable with and has a lot of respect for, like Clancy Barone over on the offensive side, who's the tight end coach, uh, as well as uh, Todd Grantham, who they brought in as a defensive line coach, specifically with the goal of helping limit mobile quarterbacks. They bring him from the college game to help with that. Cody Burns, he brought in, and that was a big swap. We don't talk about it anymore, but last year, when Dennis Allen became the head coach, one of the first moves that he had was that he got rid of Coach CJ, the, the wide receivers coach that everyone loved. And then he swapped over to Cody Burns and look at what Cody Burns has done. So there's there's a more cohesive, more synergistic coaching staff. And I think that that works um, a lot better in terms of setting up Dennis Allen to win. So I do think that this team in 2023 should be improved and better than it's 2022. And I don't think that the New Orleans Saints would disagree with me if I when I say that if they stay healthy, right, if they stay healthy enough, relatively healthy for an NFL team and um, don't improve in 2023, then 2023 would be a failure as compared to 2022. So I don't think that anybody would disagree with that. So that's where I am. You have every reason to believe that this team should be better. They have every reason to be better. So their only job now is to go out there, prove you right. That's really where we are. But there are some big questions still on the way, even with phase three, having wrapped up training camp around the corner. And maybe the biggest question that still remains is, is this 90 man roster going to be that 90 man roster? The one when training camp opens? I don't think so. And I'll tell you why, as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Saints brought to you by our friends at FanDuel, America's number one sports book and the official sports book of the NFL. But Maybe you're wanting to get in on MLB odds with MLB being underway and you know maybe your favorite team is the Astros, maybe your favorite team is the, 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 the Braves and you want to get in on some of the action around Major League Baseball. Well, you can absolutely do that 
ORET FanDuel today. And right now, if you're a new customer, you're also going to be able to get a no sweat first bet of up to one thousand dollars that's bonus bets that come back to you if your first bet doesn't win so if you're a new customer you want to take advantage of that you're going to want to head over to fanduel.com slash locked on today that's going to make you valid or 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 validate i guess the 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 thousand dollar no sweat first bet that will come back to you if that first bet doesn't hit you could check out uh the college world series as well i'm repping my lsu garb today make sure you go and check out locked on lsu because paul steens is a beast and so there's a whole bunch for you to check out even beyond that, you can even get into some early NFL odds and stuff like that as well. So FanDuel.com slash locked on is the place to go. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sports betting partner of MLB. All right, family, continuing on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. Thanks as always, making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day. For all the everydayers out there, tomorrow's episodes, we're going to dive into some of the most more underrated and undervalued storylines of this offseason, leading off with how much this New Orleans Saints team completely flipped its tight end room from liability to maybe one of the strongest positions on offense. So we're going to get to that and much more in tomorrow's episodes. Make sure you come back through for that. Uh, Happy belated Father's Day to folks. Happy Juneteenth to everybody as well. Rolling right along here on today's episode of Locked on Saints. So now we're taking a look at kind of the biggest question that remains ahead of training camp for the Saints. Now they're through phase three. Everybody gets a little bit of a I'm going to I'm going to very very strongly use air quotes when I say vacation or time away because obviously everybody's going to be working hard and getting ready for training camp and everything but the the big question for me leading into all that isn't necessarily about the players that we've already seen it kind of comes down to players that might be new by the time that we get to training camp like is this 90 man roster right now that the New Orleans Saints just finished mini camp with going to be the 90 man roster going in to training camp and i don't think it will be and and there's a couple of different reasons why the the first of which is that you get the opportunity to kind of evaluate the roster during mandatory mini camps o- otas before that which are voluntary and then you'll see kind of this little flurry of moves that happens at the end of mandatory mini camps we saw that with six transactions on the friday right after mandatory minis closed up where they moved on from guys like Malik Flowers and Sir Roderick Thompson, as well as Yusir Durant. At least for now, the door's always open and there's always a possibility that those guys come back. But then the additions of Lynn Bowden Jr. and Kiki Cody and um, and Billy, uh, Billy Price, those were all guys that they ended up bringing in and adding to the mix. And I don't think that they're necessarily done there, because if you think about it, there's still two big position groups that the Saints haven't really added veterans to just yet. Defensive line, particularly on the edge, and linebacker. And I have a hard time believing that they won't tinker with those positions a little bit further. Now, they might tinker with those positions and bring in veterans that don't make the roster, but I'd be shocked if they didn't continue to bring in some some talent there. And one of the reasons why it feels so likely that there will be new players that are arriving either at the beginning of training camp or that are even signed to the roster before training camp is that this is when veterans like to sign their contracts. They don't usually like to sign their contracts for voluntary OTAs and mandatory minicamps because you're dedicating yourself to a three-day minicamp that could end your career if you don't do things right or if you take a step the wrong way or if somebody else bumps their knee into your knee or, or whatever. Like There's so much risk to just those days. So they probably wouldn't go but don't want to fork up the $100,000 that it would cost them on what would probably be a pretty minuscule quote unquote contract for an NFL veteran uh, going into minicamp by by not going to minicamp. Then they're going to get fined and all these other things. There's no need to worry about any of that. So instead, because you can't rescind fines anymore after the most recent CBA negotiations as a team, which is what used to happen, a player like wouldn't show up for minicamps, a team understood why they would end up getting the fines. And then when when it was available, when the option was available to them, the team would just resend those fines from via the NFL and then bam, everything would be fine. You can't do that anymore. Now, once the NFL finds you, you're fined and there's nothing your club can do to help you with that aside from appeal, but these aren't appealing things. Anyway, let's not get into the legal logistics and guard and jargon around the CBA uh, as much of a nerd as I, I as I am am want and as am known to be for it. Um, but I do think that this is now when veterans like the Yannick Ngakwe's of the world, the, the Corey Littleton's of the world, the Deion Jones's of the world, the Quan Alexander's of the world, who just, I believe he had a visit with the Cleveland Browns not too long ago. So I think that like all of those, those veterans that are looking for you know deals and things like that might be in a situation closer to training camp where they're actually looking to 
sign on to a deal. And so there are going to be more opportunities for the New Orleans Saints to go out and sign some players, especially with $13.5 million left to spend. Now, keep in mind, that's only the top 51 players on their depth chart that are counting against their uh, salary cap right now. But even if you add in another couple of $700,000 contracts, you're still in a situation to where you're sitting on $12.1 $12.1 million instead of $13.4 million. Oh no, woe is Saints. So I think that when I look at it from that perspective, there's just a lot of reason to believe that the Saints 90-man roster will change before training camp opens up. But where will it change? Defensive line, linebacker, as I mentioned, are the two big ones, but depth at wide receiver is still a big question mark. Who are the, who are the guys behind your top three? There's a supplemental draft coming up. Is the Purdue wide receiver something you know, a type of player that the Saints would want to get involved in and give up a pick from next year in order to draft him in this year's supplemental draft, which is back for the first time since what, 2019, I think was the last one, the COVID year it stopped. And then now it's, it's finally uh, kind of coming back. So wide receiver is still a spot that they can, that they can look at. Offensive line depth is a spot that they could still look at. Defensive line depth is still a spot that we, that they can look at. And I don't just mean the edge rusher spot, which we just talked about. I constantly bring up Yannick Ngakwe and all that stuff. I know. But I also look at the interior defensive line that could probably still use another veteran or they could use another, just another person. You know, it doesn't have to be a veteran. You know, you've got Jack Heflin and some of these other guys that have also been brought in, but maybe there's other talent out there that could be available to you, even if it's just for training camp purposes or veteran leadership purposes, things like that. So I do think that you're looking at all of those positions as ones where the Saints could say, you know what, Um, would like to have another body there would like to have somebody else to split the snaps with this person, all that. And you might see players getting exchanged every now and then too. I mean, they they brought in uh, Jake Vargas, the, the fullback, so that they could split some snaps between him and Adam Prentice. But we've seen the Saints be active at that fullback position during training camp. We've watched them be active at running back during training camp. We've watched them be active at linebacker during training camp. These are things that they've almost always done. And so I do think that there will be changes leading up to training camp or within the first week of training camp, which would mean bringing some players in to for, for visits the first couple of days of training camp and then potentially landing on a contract within the week or at the top of the next week or whatever. So I do think that there's a lot of opportunity for them to continue to do that. I don't think that the 90-man roster will look the same. And I think that's that's my biggest question ahead of camp. Like, who's Who's going to be out there? Who's, who's going to be out there? Y'all done? No, you ain't done. Like, you can't be. You, you're not going to be because this is a team that went out and signed Janoris Jenkins when they had two starting corners. They drafted Alante Taylor when they had two starting corners. They drafted Jordan Howden when they had two starting safeties and maybe one of the better safety tandems in the NFL on paper. They, they've they rebuilt the wide receiver room, or they're maybe still in process of rebuilding the wide receiver room. That might be a spot that they continue to work on. They had a starting quarterback. They went and got another starting quarterback. Like There's all of these things that we've watched the Saints do over the course of the last entire existence of the franchise. Oh, not really entire existence of the franchise, but like the most recent era of the franchise, one of those things, era, one of the things that has made this team so good in the years where they have been successful is by not settling, is by generating competition, is by consistently adding talent. And I think that's what the New Orleans Saints will look to do. Because again, just like we we remarked in the first segment, they have everything that they need to be successful in 2023. For 2023 be better than 2022. Why stop now? Why stop now? No reason to. No reason to, especially when you got all that money, all that money awaiting for you that you can utilize. So coming up next, when you generate all that competition, then there are competitions and there are position battles and things like that. So I'm going to give you my top five position battles that we're going to be breaking down over the course of the next few weeks and getting a little bit more in detail with, as well as some other position battles that are kind of like honorable mentions that you'll want to be keeping track of over the course of training camp. Got that coming up for you as we continue on to wrap up today's episode of Locked on Saints, but a Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it. Here that nation wrap it up today's episode of Locked on Saints. It is a Monday episode for all the everydayers out there. We'll be back with you Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Of course, uh, we are not going anywhere, even though it's a little bit of a break for the team. No break here. Uh, Monday through Friday, and probably more as we continue to go through. Live show is going to be back this week, too. I'm As you're listening or watching this, taking this in, however you take it in, I'm probably home, actually, uh, by that point. So 
Yes. Uh, very excited to be back in New Orleans. So um, I want to I want to kind of walk through my top five position battles here. I'm going to give some early indications about who I think the challenger is versus who I think the favorite is, maybe something like that. But I'm not ready to sit here and definitively say this person will win, that person will win, this person will win. Because the truth is, based upon what we just discussed, see, we're scaffolding, we're building here. Um, Based upon what we just discussed, we don't really even know who all is involved in these position battles just yet. We know who's involved in them right now, but we don't know who's going to be involved with them by the time that we get to next month. So I do think that's important to keep in mind. So this might be one of those segments that kind of drives people crazy where they go, oh, can you just say it in 30 seconds instead of taking 30 minutes? No, I, I can't. I'm an entertainer. I'm here to do a show. That would be a ripoff to people. So what I'm, what I'm looking at with this instead, though, is not who's going to win, who's going who's gonna to lose. It's just that like the big takeaway is that the Saints have a lot of position battles, and it's a good thing because it's going to make the team better. That's kind of the biggest thing. So I'm going to give you my top five. Send me your top five as well, because I would love to know. We'll do some polls and things like that over the course of the offseason. Uh, but once we start diving into these position battles, this is the one we're going to be starting with later on this week to taking a, like a deeper dive into it. Uh, and it's cornerback two. Th- that's, that's obviously the biggest position battle that everyone is super excited for media. I'm sure players are excited about it. I'm sure the players participating in it are excited about it. Fans are excited about it. And it's a great position to have a battle because you get to see them in full glory all the time, right? I mean, they're, this is a cornerback position. It's Alante Taylor versus Paul Sinadibo, or more appropriately, Paul Sinadibo, who I think is the favorite versus Alante Taylor, who I think is the challenger. And maybe that's a seniority-based thing. I don't know. But also, Paul Sinadibo looked really good during minicamp. Like really, really good during minicamp. But so did Alante Taylor. He had a pick six at one point or what would have been a pick six. I- anyway, these guys are going to go blow for blow. And I think that's part of why it's so exciting and so fun is because they're also both really, really good. And as we discussed with Doug Mouton last week, like if the Saints can find a way to get all three of these dudes out on the field at the same time, then you get all three of these dudes out on the field at the same time because they are that. They are dudes. And so you want them on the field all the time. But for right now, it's Paulson versus Alante. It's Stanford versus Tennessee, which, well, never mind. LSU took Tennessee out in the College World Series, so I wasn't going to make a reference to that, but never mind. That doesn't matter. Um, But so I think the thing that you're looking for here and the reason why I get so excited about this one is because they're both so good and they're both so good in different ways. Like they're so fun to watch and they're both really physical and they both have speed and they both have really good ball production. They both have really good ball skills because they both have... Uh, experience outside of their position at corner. Paul Sadebo, former wide receiver, Alante Taylor, former baseball player. Like there's so many of these different things that are really cool that I think translate into what will make this competition so fun and so important because it's a premier position. So this isn't a situation to where you're battling for a depth spot. You're battling for one of the most important positions in football, which is the cornerback spot. Quarterback, left tackle, edge rusher, wide receiver, cornerback. Those are your five most important positions on the field. Some people would argue because they are the ones that maximize or minimize ball production on a daily basis or on a game, game by game basis. Bam. That's a big time battle. Number two, I'm looking at the linebacker in coverage. Who's the guy uh, behind Demario Davis? Who's the guy behind Pete Werner? I'm not talking about the strong side pass rusher that would be there as the third linebacker on base defense reps. And when I say base defense reps, I just mean the Saints base defense, quote unquote, is four down linemen and three linebackers. You could call nickel their base defense because they're mostly in uh, nickel coverage, but, and that would be five defensive backs one, two, three, four, five, five cents, five cents is a nickel, it's nickel coverage. Uh, but the NFL knows base defense as your kind of standard setting four, three, three, four, although three, four defenses don't. Is that really a base three? Anyway, it doesn't matter. So, <laughs> but who's the guy that is charged with coming into the game if DeMario Davis needs a playoff? Who's the guy that's charged to be in coverage and take Pete Werner's spot if Pete Werner needs a playoff? And I'm just saying needs a playoff, but there's injury and all these other things, of course, that go in that. So so who's your Caden Ellis for this year? Like Caden Ellis was not the strong side linebacker that they turned to in their base defense. It was always Zach Bond. And then they went to Caden when guys like when when Pete Werner got hurt. Uh, and so I, I'm looking at like, is that DeMarco Jackson or do they bring somebody in to challenge it? If they don't bring anybody in the challenge there, salute sayonara, it's, it's, it's DeMarco Jackson. But I, I think they'll bring in a veteran. Um, next up, I'm looking at defensive end opposite Cam Jordan. Yeah, y'all, it's going to be a competition. And I think the assumed starter right now, sensibly so, is, is Carl Granderson. He, 
he he ran Marcus Davenport out of town effectively, like taking snaps, taking starts, all this other stuff. But you've got other guys that they believe in. Isaiah Foskey. You've got a guy like Peyton Turner who they'd love to see rise to that occasion, all that. So I do think that is going to be a little bit of a battle to see who's going to be that guy opposite Cam Jordan. For me, Carl Granderson has the early lead, but I'm not sleeping on anybody until we see. Uh, Wide receiver four, who's going to be the next wide receiver behind the big three? Michael Thomas, Chris Olave, Rashid Shahid. Who fills the X receiver role if Michael Thomas deals with another injury? Who holds on to uh, Chris Olave's role if he has an injury? Who uh, steps in and does all of the things that Rashid Shahid's going to be ready to do in 2023 if that groin injury proves to be something that's pesky over time, right? So who are going to be those guys? And that might change based upon who you're replacing and who you're swapping out and all those other things. So just kind of like who's the top of the depth chart or of the, the food pyramid uh, when the starters uh, go down or, or you need somebody to come in in place of the starters at wide receiver. And then finally, I'm going slot cornerback. Bradley Roby, maybe. Smoke Monday, perhaps. There you go. I said his name for you. Smoke Monday. It is a Smoke Monday after all. Per sources, Smoke Monday was referenced in the most recent episode of Locked on Saints. Zero days without since shenanigans, since Smoke Monday. Uh, Ugo Amati um, is in that conversation. Alante Taylor could be in that conversation. Paul Sadebo could be in that conversation. Jordan Howden will be in that conversation. So who's your starting slot corner? And what happens with Bradley Roby in the midst of all that too? Like there's been so much conversation. Every time that somebody talks about the Saints making a trade, Bradley Roby's almost always involved in that. So is there smoke? Or is there fire where there's smoke there? Or no pun intended, r- regards to Smoke Monday. Uh, but you know what's going to happen? Who's going to be that starter in, in in the slot on the inside on the defense? And then there there's some folks that are there are some honorable mentions here that I won't fully dive into. But safety, there's a lot of depth there. Offensive line, defensive line, those are important ones, particularly over on the interior, and and many many more. So I think there's a lot of great position battles that's going to make training camp really really interesting. None of which are more interesting to me than CB two. And then maybe defensive end to even though I put linebacker in between the two. So I, I'm really, really interested to see what's going to happen there. We're going to be breaking those down every Thursday, right? Every Thursday, we'll go corner, then we're going to go to edge, and we're going to go to linebacker, and then we'll continue to go through. And then we'll update as there are new players that join the roster and things like that, if anybody joins at that position. Otherwise, we'll be waiting and then breaking it down all throughout training camp as well. But that's Thursday is going to be our position battle breakdown day every week throughout the week. So let me know. Let me know who you think is going to win all those position battles. And let me know who you think are the top five position battles for the New Orleans Saints offense defense. There's a kicker battle that's going to be there too. Will Lutz versus uh, Blake Groupie, all that. So there's going to be a lot going on there. All right. That's going to do it. That's going to do it for today. Make sure you go and check out Locked on LSU. Go celebrate um, LSU continuing to move on through the College World Series with the one, the only Caroline Fenton, who does a wonderful job over there. Go and check out Locked on Pelicans as well. Jake Madison doing a phenomenal job. Really, you're like one and only place that you need to be going right now for everything, everything going on around the Pelicans. And I mean everything. Mad respect for Jake for (laughs) what he's having to cover right now. So make sure you go check that out as well. I appreciate y'all. As always, don't forget uh, for making us your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget for all the everydayers out there, come back tomorrow because we're taking a look at those uh, underrated storylines from the New Orleans Saints leading off with the tight end room, which has gone from liability to maybe one of their most solid skill position groups. So we're going to break all that down tomorrow. And I appreciate y'all as always for making Locked on Saints a part of your day, part of your routine for saying yes to me and the show. As always, if you see me, say hi. And if you need anything else around your New Orleans Saints, make sure you follow me on Twitter at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how you're mom and them. And trust you that nation. I'll holla at you. 